Our next speaker is the council member from the city of San Diego, Joe LaCava. Uh, Councilman LaCava is an engineer who worked in the public works for many years and has a good fundamental knowledge of what infrastructure is all about. Uh, he's the chair of the environmental committee and uh, we're looking for him for a lot of leadership, uh, Joe LaCava. So I didn't bring a PowerPoint slide. <laughs> and I know we're a little bit behind schedule, so let's see if I can help out said no politician ever. I'm up here, I have the podium, I'm in control here, <laughs> no. But, but seriously, I, I do want to thank Rick uh, and Laura and everybody at Zero Waste San Diego for hosting today and to invite me to speak again uh, before you. Um, as, as Rick mentioned, I am the council, council president pro tem on the San Diego City Council, I represent District 1, which starts from Pacific Beach and goes north to the city of Del Mar and picks up Carmel Valley and Pacific Highlands Ranch, which is very interesting for me. So I have two of the oldest communities in San Diego and some of the newest communities and dealing with the constituent issues and how we deliver city service gets to be an interesting challenge. And as Rick mentioned, uh, for the third year in a row, I am chair of the Environment uh, Committee uh, which is a committee of the city council. And I will tell you, coming into office, I never imagined as a civil engineer that I would become the leading environmental voice uh, on the council uh, in consultation with the various city departments and the mayor's office, uh, but as a role that I relish and take very seriously because, as all you know, and the reason you're here is because it is all about what we need to do now to preserve our quality of life, to uplift communities that have not been taken care of, to make sure that our future generations can enjoy the same kind of city and uh, world that we enjoy today. So um, as I mentioned with the Environment Committee, impl implementing the city's climate action plan is the com uh, committee's primary objective. And that includes recycling, pollution reduction, food justice, and fulfilling the commitments of the zero waste plan. Of course, all of you, and the reason you're here is because you understand the critical nature of these issues. But to elevate their importance, I have followed many of the recommendations and policies and guidance that all of you have offered us and included them in my 2024 work plan for the committee. And throughout this year, I will continue to use the Environment Committee to help the city improve access to healthy foods, reduce waste, keep our beaches and canyons clean to improve water quality, improve our recycling rates, and begin construction of our city's new organics processing facility. This is very ambitious, but I believe it is um, uh, achievable. And the people that are truly making this happen, I can do policy and legislation and budgeting, but the people that actually make this possible is the city's environmental services department. And I know our department director, Renee Robertson, is here, whether she's still in the room, because I think she took a phone call. Uh, but please join me in recognizing Renee and everybody at Environmental Services Department for the good work they do every day. Oh, there she is. She is there. Right in the front row, and I totally missed her. Um, the one of the things that I wanted to reflect on before I speak a little bit about uh, Measure B um, we, we do our advocacy, we make our plans, we have our goals, we lobby uh, elected officials, but then life happens. And I wanted to highlight what, ha as many of you know, what happened on January 22nd. The extraordinary rainfall, some call it a thousand year storm event, hit our city and many parts of our region. Hundreds of homes in Southeast San Diego and the Rolando neighborhood were severely damaged by floods. The damage was extensive, and most families lost everything in their personal possession. Furniture, bedding, clothes, personal effects. Over 1,000 people moved their ruined belongings out of their flood-damaged houses and onto the sidewalks and the streets in front of their houses. And it was the Environmental Services Department that stepped in as, with remarkable lightning speed to help clean that up. And whether it was city packer trucks that were there, whether it was dumpsters that were brought out, 
whether it was some of the private haulers that showed up, they moved quickly to remove that debris and get it out of the way so that those folks can start to think about what rebuilding looks like and to make sure that when that next rainstorm inevitably comes, as it did, that that debris would not be vulnerable to be washed into South Choyas Creek, into Choyas Creek, and then into the bay. And so I'm gonna do something extraordinary. I'm gonna ask you to thank Renee and her team in environmental services again, because they tirelessly worked to deliver on that. Um, it is an extraordinary moment that is still ongoing. These people are still hurting. We're grateful that President Biden did declare an individual uh, emergency so those individuals can get help. Uh, we're still waiting for a more public declaration of emergency so that the city and the county and the other jurisdictions can begin to rebuild our public infrastructure that was damaged as well. So the other topic I want to talk about is the foundational work that, again, Renee, boy, she is a busy person, <laughs> is doing on implementing Measure B. So it was a year ago that I was here at this symposium that I was invited to talk about the passage of Measure B, a long overdue amendment to the People's Ordinance. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the craziness that we have in the city of San Diego in our long history, the People's Ordinance was passed literally over 100 years ago, and it said the city could not charge for collecting your trash. If you could put out a city authorized bin in front of your property, the city was obligated to pick it up without any charge. And it's had a lot of implications. For too long, uh, it tied the city's hands on the services that we can provide to our customers and to create the budgetary limitations on environmental services and our general fund. And now for the second year in a row, I'm happy to be here and bring more good news. As planned and on schedule, the city has initiated the Prop 218 process. How many people know what Prop 218 is? It's a state bill, so some of you do. So Prop 218 is what protects us taxpayers and our user of municipal services. Prop 218 says, yes, a municipality can charge a fee, but you cannot charge any more than it costs you to actually deliver that service or benefit to the person who is paying the fee. So it is kind of a taxpayer uh, protection, if you will. So that also means it is a very complicated process to figure out how to set rates and to set a scope of work. So if you've read some of the comments in the media or the pundits, why don't you just take your budget, divide it by the number of households you're collecting, and that's your fee. Well, that would last about two seconds in a court of law because you know someone's going to challenge it. So it is a much more complicated, intensive, and talk about dotting your I's and crossing your T's and talking about belt and suspenders and actually two belts and two suspenders. And if you're going to do this, you have to do it right. So earlier this month, the Environment Committee advanced the hiring of a consultant team to conduct what we call a cost of service study. And that will provide the city and our residents with a proposed rate structure that ultimately will come to the city council for adoption. We're asking a lot of this consultant team because again, we have never done this for the past 100 years. If you're a private hauler, and my apologies to the private haulers, you can simply say, we offer a service, this is how much you charge, you wanna sign up, and it's all done. Municipalities, city governments don't get to do that. So it also gives us an opportunity to increase much more flexibility. If we have more resources at our disposal, we can think differently about what environmental services means, what about collection really means going forward. And we have an opportunity to go out to the public and say, what is it that you want? Some of the ideas that have been tossed around include more frequent blue bin, the recycling, which now happens every two weeks. Maybe it should go to every week. Maybe it should be a pay as you throw. If you generate more uh, recycling or more waste, you should pay more. Maybe there should be more frequent bulk pickups. The city occasionally does go into neighborhoods and says anything that's too bulky for you to put in your bins, we'll come and pick it up. And maybe we should do that more frequently. Also, and I think it's a key to, the, to a zero waste uh, philosophy, 
do we stagger fees between the black bins, which are trash, the blue bins, which are recyclables, and the green bins, which are organics? Maybe we should charge differently. Maybe we should use it as a tool within the Prop 218 umbrella to incentivize people's behavior. As we know, a lot of what you all do every day in your good fights for zero waste, the average person may not really think about. Maybe you're starting to have some influence. Maybe we're starting to see a cultural shift. But by and large, often what we have to do is create incentives uh, for folks to change their behavior, to change the culture of what they think about when they're thinking about getting rid of something they no longer want in their household. So we also have to make sure that in this extensive study that it is transparent, accurate, and equitable. And this means a lot of widespread outreach that will consider customer needs, affordability, and how to be most efficient in delivering that service. That's another component to that. So for those of you who live in the city of San Diego and are outraged by the fact of why are we spending four and a half million dollars to actually do this cost of service study, I believe over half or nearly half of that is just about customer outreach. Again, we've not done this in 100 years. We have to think and act differently. We have to interact with the public. We have to reach every resident and business in the city of San Diego to get their opinions. What we also have to think about is potential relief to our low income residents. Folks are hurting working in low wage jobs in a very expensive city. Prop 218, unfortunately, that is more focused on what's the benefit you're giving and how much does it cost for you to deliver that, and that puts a cap, also makes it nearly impossible, not impossible, but nearly impossible to assess fees based on your income. So you can't say, you're a wealthy individual, we're going to charge you more, you have a minimum wage job, we're going to charge you less. We're not allowed to do that under Prop 218. But we are going to do everything we can to minimize any financial impact on our most vulnerable San Diegans. When this contract was presented at the Environment Committee that I chair, my colleagues and I discussed at length the scope of the outreach. And as I said, this is a rare opportunity to start from scratch and customize a program that truly fits with our residents' needs, and we must be as inclusive as possible in its development while we're driving this conversation about zero waste. So to bring you to date, what's next? I anticipate that we'll see the cost of service study contract come to full council in the month, next month. Government doesn't move very fast, as you know. Uh, and when it's approved, or if it's approved, I can't predict that, uh, we'll see more than a year robust customer and stakeholder outreach. And this will lead to a fee schedule being considered by early 2026 and a rollout of the program in the summer of 2026. Is that right, Renee? <laughs> on that, but also on that rollout of new services and associated monthly fee, it won't happen overnight. This is a big shift in the city of San Diego, so we mean to be very thoughtful and careful about how we do it out. So there'll be a transition period. We need to allow the department to rethink about how what their operations look like, make sure they have the equipment they need to do it if it's differently than today. And we need to make sure that we minimize the impact on residents uh, in the city. So in the meantime, Renee and her team are standing up a launch uh, website for you to sign up and get updates on the process. And I believe we'll be looking at that website come April, if I'm not mistaken. There we go. So I want to thank you all for your advocacy and supporting Measure B. As a reminder, it passed very narrowly. It did pass, so that's what counts. Uh, but we appreciate any help that you did in getting the voters out there or supporting uh, Measure B, as well as your participation in the upcoming stakeholder, uh, stakeholder outreach. So this is a unique opportunity for our city, for our climate action plan, for achieving our zero waste goals, and for our residents. So I look forward to hearing from each of you in shaping the future of this program. And with that, again, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your continued advocacy in support of something that is so very important for our city and our region. Thank you.